Welcome to episode eight of Behind the Membership. In this episode, I'm talking with Shannon Rogers from the Hand Tool School. And Shannon has a slightly different membership model to the norm. And in fact, one of the things that we discuss in this interview is how he decided to add a membership element as essentially an upsell to his existing courses. Shannon's also a master at community building and has some great retention tips to share with us. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode, so let's get started. Welcome to Behind the Membership with Callie Willows. Real people, real stories, real memberships. Today I'm joined on the show by Shannon Rogers from the handtoolschool.net. Welcome to the show, Shannon, and thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure, Callie. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. It's always great to speak to you. Um, your membership site is the Hand Tool School, which is kind of a does what it says on the tin kind of name, which I really like. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the site and what it offers, first of all? Sure. Uh, it's it's all about woodworking, but specifically woodworking um, without power tools. We we do things the way they did it in the 18th century and, and prior to that. And it's not because we wish we lived in the 18th century. I love my internet, you know. I, I broadcast live and stream live and, and all that fun 21st century technology stuff in my own shop. I just don't happen to have any power tools. It, it kind of appeals to, well, everybody really. Um, anybody who sits at a desk in front of a computer all day or doesn't physically make anything. I, I, I pull people in left and right all over the globe who are feel like something's missing in their life and they want to actually build something. And, you know, it may be that they want to build something out of wood. Maybe they want to build something out of metal. If it's metal, then I say, okay, well, I know a guy. Um, I'm a woodworker. Um, But also the hand tool side of things, it it provides a deeper connection to the craft, I think, than the big loud machines creating all kinds of noise and dust. And you kind of feed a board in one side and it comes out the other side. It's machining. It's not it's not really woodworking. Ooh, I'm going to get in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> My power tool friends are going to send me hate mail for that. But it, it is, it's, it's more about craftsmanship. It's about kind of taking a step back and building on fundamental skills that will only make you, frankly, a better woodworker later on. Because there will always be a time when the machine fails. Either the, the tool is not big enough for the board you want to run across it, or it won't go to a certain angle or some other technical thing. And I I just, I see so many people who are like, well, I guess I can't build this now. And it's like, pick up a chisel, pick up a saw. And people look at you like you've got three heads, like say what now? Um, And it is really much a lost, a lost art. You know, it was every crafts, not even every crafts person, every human being in the 18th century knew how to handle a saw. Because if you couldn't cut down your firewood, you froze and you died. You know, I mean, it was, it was, these were essential skills that every single person had, not just cabinet makers and joiners, farmers, you know, well, I, was there such a thing as a housewife in the 18th century? I don't even think so. Whatever. <laughs> Probably not. Everybody, everybody had these skills because it was necessary for life and we've just lost them. So we are fortunate now that we are in a society where we can have free time and we don't need to know how to pick up a handsaw or a chisel or anything like that. But I think our DNA says, the caveman in all of us says, I need, to, I need to bang on something. I need to sharpen tool with rock and make fire. Um, so that's what the hand tool school is about. It is, it is about teaching woodworking kind of, I even hate to say the old fashioned way, the traditional way of woodworking. It's a yeah, long answer. <laughs> no, that sounds awesome. And, you know, I have to admit, like, before you joined the Academy, I, it's not something I'd ever have thought of as a niche. <laughs> sure. Um, but it's actually, a niche um, within a niche. Actually. Yeah. Um, but actually, like hearing you talk about it and things that that makes a lot of sense. Um, would you say your members are predominantly there for um, doing woodworking as a hobby rather than it being kind of a, a site for professionals? Or do you have kind of a mix of both? <clears throat> I think it's pro- no. I don't think I know. It's it's mostly hobbyists. It's mostly people who are um, have a day job somewhere. Um, nine times out of ten, it's something you know in front of a computer. Um, there are quite a few of them who whose aim it is to become a professional. Who they want to you know throw off the the day to day and and build furniture for a living. Um, to be perfectly honest, the hand tool approach 
it can be very difficult to make money that way. Um, you know, let's be real. Machines do make things a heck of a lot faster. Hand tools don't have to be slow, but when time is money, it, it's a little tough for a professional cabinet maker, furniture maker to, to make their living. But I've had some pros who've come in mainly because they don't have time to learn to use these things. And they know that it would make them better in their, in their professional job. Um, so a few of them have come in and um, picked up some of those skills along the way. Yeah. Cool. So, and, and this is purely just uh, out of interest from my house. I, I'm imagining that the site is predominantly male members. Yes. That sounds a little yeah. bit wrong there, but, but. No, no, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, the funny thing is, is it, it, it's not entirely male, um, but I think I could count on two hands the number of women in the school. But man, they are some of the most amazing craftsmen. Like some of the most incredible stuff posted in my community forum is from the women in my community. And, and I'm always like, oh, yeah, girl power. Um, it's just, it's, it's exciting to see that. And it's such a, um, it's the, the guys in my community are so excited that there's a woman there. You're like, this is so exciting. This is so great. You know, welcome, welcome, welcome. And, uh, you know, all the women in my community feel very, very um, well cared for, shall we say. But, yeah, it's a male-dominated industry. Eh, what can you say? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely, you know, in the same way you don't get a huge amount of men in, in kind of the knitting memberships and things like that. You <laughs> yeah, know, I think there is true. kind of that, that more natural divide. Um, but there, yeah. There's a long going schism between the knitters and the woodworkers. Oh, really? <laughs> if you look at the, the podcast ratings on, on, uh, in the iTunes library, you'll see this war between the knitters and the woodworkers. Yeah. It's been going on since like the late nineties. So. <laughs> okay. I'll try not to put my foot into it too much there. Then. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and so, You've got a slightly different setup to most membership sites in the hand tool school. So you've kind of got your your semesters, which are essentially standalone courses. Mm -hmm. And then you have the apprenticeship, which is the more recurring traditional membership element. Is that right? Correct. Although I would call apprenticeship closer to coaching than okay. I would a, you know, a traditional membership. Um, in the fact that it's not, well, I mean, so many of the memberships that I'm a part of, it's kind of a it's either an all access thing or it's like a levels and you've got this recurring content that comes out. The content that apprenticeship that I create for apprenticeship is directly related to what is going on in the apprentices shops. So whatever they're working on, whatever they're struggling with, that content is created um, to address that particular issue. So it, it is, it's coaching on mass, if you will, scaled up coaching. Um, yeah. And, uh, and I make that distinction just because I'm actually toying with the whole idea of an all access kind of as an alternate product. Um, I, I, in one of my um, sales videos, I liken semesters to the textbook and apprenticeship to the study group. Love that. Um, and while I think that works really well, I also think that there's room for, you know, super secret third option of all access, come in and binge and go nuts. Um, but that's, that's for the future. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So how long's the, the school been up and running for now? Uh, we launched in October, 2010. Oh gosh. And Seven yeah. years. Yeah. Kind of, kind of nuts actually. <laughs> um, and, and as, as you probably know, I did a massive kind of redesign and almost a relaunch, uh, almost a year ago. 363 days ago, to be exact. <laughs> um, so yeah, almost exactly a year ago, I, I, I didn't shut down by any means, but I kind of stopped producing content and completely re-architected everything, added in that recurring apprenticeship option. So I, I consider even though the site is, is seven years old, I'm kind of on reset and I'm on one year at this point, the way I look at it. Cool. So what actually, you know, so you've obviously done the big reset nearly a year ago now, mm -hmm. but going back, what inspired you to create the hand tool school in the first place? What was that kind of initial spark that made you go down this path? Sure. Well, I, I started a blog, um, renaissancewoodworker.com, uh, back in 2008. And it was mainly at, at the time I was, I was doing kind of semi pro furniture making and I kind of wanted a place where I could highlight the stuff that I was building. Um, and blogs were all the rage at that point. And my thought was, well, this could be a place where customers could see um, 
all the work that goes in. Why does that piece of furniture cost so much? Well, here's all the work that goes into it. Very quickly discovered that no one really cares. They just want the piece of furniture. And the people that cared were the other woodworkers. You were getting all these questions about, well, how did you do that? Or why did you execute that particular joint that way? Um, how would you go about building this? And suddenly, all you're doing is talking to your contemporaries rather than your potential customers. So I was like, okay, that's cool. I'll, 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 I'll do that. You know? And it was, just, it was a fun way to kind of share and, and touch base with the community, which frankly was very, very new at that point. Um, so then... I'm, I'm, I'm a ham. I have a performance degree, actually. So I have no problem getting in front of a camera, getting in front of a microphone. So I was like, what the heck? Let's start a podcast. Um, started as an audio podcast, The Renaissance Woodworker. Um, went heavily video uh, about a year into it. And I just started building this community uh, of people that really liked what I was doing. At the time, I was probably about 50% of my work was with power tools and 50% with hand tools. But I was quickly falling off the, the cliff down the, the hand tool rabbit hole. And that resonated with my audience. They really liked seeing these techniques. And even then, I mean, it, there's been a bit of a renaissance in, in hand tools. There's a lot more manufacturers um, that are bringing out new tools. There's a lot more people writing about it. I am certainly not the only hand tool only guy out there in this little niche. Um, but back then there wasn't anybody. Um, there's a, there's a guy on public broadcasting here called Roy Underhill. Um, he does a show called The Woodwright Shop. It's been on the air for about 36 years. Um, and that was it. And they don't even carry it locally. My local PBS doesn't carry it here. Um, I mean, that was the only way you could get this information. And then it was a 22-minute show once a week, no time to actually get into any techniques. So the more I began getting into this, the more I began really enjoying it and, and realizing there was just not even a paucity, a void of actual hand tool instruction. I said, I, I, I need to tap into that. And the membership site, the school model was really a way to kind of monetize that because anybody who's run a YouTube channel knows that it's a heck of a lot of work to make a living on AdSense revenue. <laughs> You know, you can, you can live off vending machines, you know, <laughs> 50 cents here or there. That's, that's about it. You know, when you get into the upper, upper echelons of millions of subscribers, it's a different game. But in this particular niche, that's hard to do. It's really hard to do to get a subscriber base that big. And even then, you're on somebody else's playground. You know, recently YouTube changed some algorithms and lots of people lost a lot of revenue because of it. So to me, it made sense at the time to build kind of a little walled garden, um, to build an actual school to the point where I put school in the name of the site. And believe me, I caught a lot of flack for that early on. You know, who is this jackass? <laughs> who is this guy who thinks that he can teach? You know, he's only got like one more year of experience than I do. Well, one of the things in the internet is all you need to know is just one more thing than the people you're talking to. Yep. <laughs> um, and, and that really carried me a long way. And here we are seven years later. And I can honestly say I am a much better woodworker than I was seven years ago. And it was funny because about two years ago, I used to be really kind of timid about the school side of things. Yeah, I am Shannon. I run the Angel School. You know, was, I, I, and I, I called them members. I didn't call them students. I still call them members um, because a lot of them are just good friends of mine, but they are students. And about two years ago, I flipped a switch and said, you know what? They're students and I'm teaching them because I've learned, I have learned a lot in seven years. I've improved as a craftsman. I've also dramatically improved my teaching ability, my teaching skills. And I'm constantly getting feedback from members about, you know, I've been struggling with this for years, 20 minutes, you explained it in such a way, you're a great teacher. So, okay, <laughs> call a spade a spade. I'm a teacher now and this is a school. And, you know, since that inception, other membership sites in that niche have, have sprung up. Several of them have fallen by the wayside. Um, but nobody, so far, nobody, everybody's fallen back in the traditional kind of membership model of, here's a project, here's a bunch of videos on that project, here's how you can build that project. Nobody has really tried to tackle the school mentality of a curriculum, of lessons, applied projects, another lesson, another applied project. Um, so far, I'm the only one doing that. So we'll see how long that lasts. 
And did the idea for that, so you're the only one doing that, did that idea, was that just coming up from how you wanted to kind of teach people or how you would have wanted to have learned? Good, good question. Um, it's because the format for instruction at the time was very quick, very quick format, you know, a lot of high speed and it's still very much the same, a lot of sped up video, maybe some voiceover, mostly just music, um, and not a lot of instruction, actual instruction, not just here's how I cut this, but here's why, here's why it's important to do this. Let's peel back and go to the underlying reasons, nature, physics, whatever, of, of how this steel interacts with this wood fiber. Um, and, and nobody was doing that. And they're really in, in YouTube, on the iTunes library, there just wasn't the place to do that, to get that detailed. Plus, to get that detailed requires a lot of work on my part. So I needed to go to a premium model. Um, I needed to have a, a pay per instruction. Um, and I also, going back to the whole, just know a little bit more than the people you're talking to, going the project model of here's a project and just, and just build this required um, a lot more, not so much knowledge, but a lot more of um, the, uh, let me just put it this way. It required a lot of people to actually want to build that exact thing that you're building. And it took a lot of time from me, the creator, to kind of um, alter it because you get this question. It's like, well, I want to build that, but you know, I want X, Y, and Z added onto it. How do I do that? Well, so then I was doing all this stuff for the project, but then doing all this consultation work at the same time, it just made much more sense to kind of skip the whole project and focus on the lessons behind the project. And that's really where the school model came out. Um, I certainly build projects but it's less about the projects and more about the skills. And, and in many instances, I'll tell my students, this is the hard way of doing this. Like if I had to build this again, I would not do it this way, but you know, you got to walk before you can fly, learn to use a chisel in this way. And trust me, there'll be a time three years from now when you're like, Oh crap, what do I do? Oh wait, remember that lesson Shannon taught me? And he said, never do this again. Here's an example of when you can do it. And, and that, that was the, the main reason that I went with the school mentality to kind of get away from, well, look at it this way. When you're a beginner, you have more questions than answers, right? So when you, somebody presents you a finished thing, whatever it is, a finished sales page that converts, it's like, well, how did you build that sales page? Why did you have that element behind that sales page? Then you get into the details of, well, you know, certain people click certain things here, certain colors resonate with your certain audience. Those are the lessons behind that finished project, that finished sales page. That's the stuff that really allows you to go out and build your own thing, um, not build my thing. And that's what I didn't want to do. I wanted to, to, to free people up to have the hand skills to build whatever they want to build. Because that is truly one of the beauties I see of working by hand. There are no limitations. You can build anything you can imagine because there's nothing more straightforward than a chisel. And if you know how to use a chisel, you're golden. So yeah, that's a really long answer to that question. But yeah. I'm starting to wish I had some, some tools myself now. See, that's, a, that's what it's all about. Just yeah. get me talking. I start yeah. to get excited and foam at the mouth when I talk about hand tools. I injure myself hoovering though. So I don't think putting tools <laughs> in my hand is probably a good idea. Uh, Mike might not like that. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so with the, with the semesters and you had the, the pattern going with the content there and the community and things, what made you decide to actually add in that apprenticeship option as well? Um, when I... When I started the school, the, the tagline was the Hand Tool School, the world's first virtual apprenticeship. That also got me in a lot of hot water <laughs> from the establishment, the established cabinet makers and, and, and the, the media. They didn't like that. But it was always my intention to create um, an atmosphere of apprenticeship. The, the old time guild systems and master and apprentice, which, uh, you know, over in the UK, you guys actually still have that. We don't have that over here. Not so much. There's only a shadow of what it used to be. And I wanted to create that atmosphere, but that's really hard to do. You're talking one-to-one -one education at that point. So I had to scale back and, and just do more of a traditional um, course layout. As technology changed, 
as marketing automation became more democratized, it used to be this, you know, $10,000 a month type tool. Um, as it became more accessible to automate things, to, to do more one-to-one marketing, um, in case your audience doesn't know, I also have a day job. I'm the director of marketing for a lumber company. <laughs> so if I get a little marketing speak, that's that hat coming on and the handle hat coming off. But I, I started to look into some of the automation and the ability to tag users and be able to speak to them based on what they just did. They just clicked on a video, a tag shows up in their profile, and now I can send them an email or send them an on-site message saying, what do you think of that video? Or more importantly, any questions after that video? Anything you're concerned about before you tackle the project in the next video? So then I started to say, okay, well, here's a way that I could actually make an apprenticeship relationship exist. Um, it's scalable. It allows coaching a, a one to many. Certainly, one to one would be wonderful, but the price point to make that work per user would be probably cost prohibitive in our market space. So it just doesn't hasn't really worked. Um, what caused me to refocus was seeing these tools and recognizing that it actually was possible. As George Lucas said, I needed to wait until technology caught up. Unfortunately, he didn't wait long enough before he made those prequels, but that's another issue. Um, so it, it, I began to look at how could I structure a coaching program? And a lot of it um, hinged around having a good community, a good community software um, that would allow um, easy, uh, everybody to have kind of their own little corner of the community. You guys call them progress logs. I call them apprentice logs. Um, and that was kind of the center of communication. And I was then able to create um, videos that responded to whatever was going on there and, and then do live broadcasts every month that specifically address questions that people have going on in there. All the while, this tagging and stuff is going on in the background. So every single apprentice, it's ridiculous. Some of my guys that have been with me a full year, they've got like 300 tags associated <laughs> with their name. But, you know, I don't need to pay attention to that. I've got software that's paying attention to it. And suddenly the coaching becomes a matter of just responding. That sounds a little shady, actually. Um, before it would be kind of having to stay on top of people and are you working on this? Are you working on this? Do you have questions about this? It's less me asking you if you have questions and me responding when they have questions because the software, the automation is asking the questions. The software is touching base with them after every video they watch every week saying, what's new in your shop? What's going on? What can I help with? And all I'm doing is just checking my inbox and responding and occasionally saying, you know what? That's a good idea for a video. Like my, my content Trello board is just coming straight from my inbox over to Trello because my members are, are feeding me what the next video should be. And all I have to do is hit reply or, you know, go over to the community, hit reply there and say, okay, here's your solution to that problem. Or have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Which if you think about it as a typical membership site owner with a community, that's all we do anyway. You know, check in with the community and unless you're not that type of owner and you're, you know, I'm very much a part of my community. That's an apprenticeship. They're there for me. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was this light bulb moment. It was like, okay, <laughs> I can do this. I can actually create an apprenticeship now, um, just by building out that web of automation. And then as I go forward, every new piece of content that gets created gets hooked into that, that web. Um, and really, it's not a web is a little too complex. It's really just <clears throat> recurring tags that kind of send out to go under the hood. I have eight different emails that are written <clears throat> that all say pretty much the same thing, just worded slightly differently. Um, what did you think? What are you working on right now? Where do you need help right now? And it, it took a long time to write them because they really do, I hope, come across as someone actually just wrote this and send it to me. But those various tags that trigger when they click on certain things, when they watch certain videos, it drops them into a loop that then sends them recurring emails uh, once a week. So every single one of my apprentices is hearing from me via email once a week to prompt them to, if nothing else, just go in and update their apprentice log. Um, because then I get a notification, I read it, and I respond. Um, yeah. 
yeah, I love how you've brought automation into helping make this work for you because I remember when you first talked about doing the apprenticeship and thinking that that was going to be a huge undertaking, but I, I, I love the way you've brought the automation in to make, you know, those aspects of it where it doesn't necessarily need that personal input from you so right. much easier. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are 86 emails in my inbox. Right now. <laughs> Um, yeah. in, Cause I have a specific inbox for apprentice logs, 86 people, Oh, 87 <laughs> have, have, so there are 87 things, but yeah. the cool thing, it's amazing how much my community supports one another. Um, I can't remember the last time I was the first person to show up and respond. It is shocking to me. I have, I actually probably should have a stern talking to with some of my members. Like, get in your shop, man. Get <laughs> off the community. It is, it is incredible. Somebody will post um, in their log and I'll show up, you know, and, and I've been very um, transparent with, with my apprentice saying, sometimes I'm there five minutes later. Sometimes it might be a couple of days, you know, and, and I have, I have what I call the bat phone. I have a, a specific contact button. If you have an issue and like, I can't go any further until I hear from Shannon, use the bat phone. And at first I was like, Oh geez, this is going to be crazy. And it's funny how people are afraid to use it. <laughs> like, I'm so sorry. I clicked on the bat phone button. I'm like, that's what it's there for. So I do know that if there is an absolute, I really need to hear from you because you know, I just screwed this up or the glue is drying. My God, man, help me. Um, that, that button is there and there's a whole separate inbox for that. And literally that sees like three emails a week at this point. Um, so, I, and those, when they come in, it's drop everything and see to it. So the expectation is, is that I may not get to it right away, but it's incredible. It'll be like an hour later and there's four other responses from other members of the community. And it's, it's this really cool thing where I have the hand tool school community, but then I have the apprenticeship community. It's a group within the group that are really supportive. And oh, by the way, the greatest marketing tool ever. Because <laughs> it's like new, new um, semester members will join and the welcome video prompts them to go introduce themselves in the community. And they introduce themselves and four or five people show up. Hey, welcome aboard. You know, good to see you're doing this. Try this project, this project. Oh, and you got to check out apprenticeship. It's like, this is awesome. <laughs> all my people are doing all my marketing for me. Yeah, we love it when members market the site for you. Oh, yeah, it's great. So speaking about the community there then, so you've got the semester members in the community and mm -hmm. you've got a separate kind of sub-community for the apprenticeship members. Does the Is that apprenticeship community completely private to the apprenticeship or can the semester members see what's going on in there as well? It is private. Um, it just doesn't even show up. Um, and I, I toyed with, with the idea of like having the headings visible so people know it's there, but um, that ended up being a little bit more technically daunting than I wanted to tackle. I may do that eventually. Just it's kind of the, Hey, here's what you're missing type thing. Whereas if it's completely out of sight, they don't really know about it. Um, I, I, I do that just because, um, well, internet forums in general are kind of the wild west, you know, they can be a little scary. People can be rude. Um, my community is a closed community, which automatically generates a lot more um, proper conduct. The apprenticeship community is even, I hate to use the word better, but even more supportive in that respect. Because these are people who not only have paid to be part of the community, but that have also continued to pay monthly to be part of a very specific learning environment. Um, and keeping... <sighs> I hate to use the word outsiders, but call it what it is. Outsiders out of that community has helped to foster that atmosphere more than anything else. Because there are a lot of people who join the hand tool school who, well, not just the hand tool school, any membership site who watch the videos and never take action on anything. They don't build anything. It's just, it's entertainment and that's cool. The people in apprenticeship are really there to take action. They're really there to further their skills. They have goals in mind it's one of the first things that they're presented with when they join is, is tell me what your next project's going to be. What are your bucket list projects? Let's build a roadmap to help you get to that project, that third project, that fourth project. And a lot of ways, it's kind of a repeating thing. They finish that project and there I am five minutes later. Great. What's the next project? You know, and, and helping them through that. They're actually producing stuff. Um, and 
the worst thing is the armchair woodworker, the armchair quarterback, the armchair marketer, you know, the guy that shows up on YouTube and starts every sentence with you should, or, um, it would be better if, (laughs) um, and, and keeping that sub community private has eliminated it entirely. And it's turned it into a family more than anything. Um, I don't know what my total, a total apprenticeship right now is still really small. It's like 108 people. Um, and like every one of them is a friend. It's very cool. Um, I don't think that would happen if it would just anybody could pop in and see what's going on there. Yeah. I love that. You've kind of, you've, it sounds like you've kind of taken the, the people from the, the, the main membership, the school that are really got that focus and that very, as you said, specific goals, and you've uh-huh. made that more exclusive area so they can flourish, essentially. Yes, and, and absolutely. I, I really love that. That's a good um, way to put it. Would you say that most people who come to the hand tool school join for a semester first and then go to the apprenticeship, or have you found that people come straight into the apprenticeship as well? Um, I mean, it's still early days with apprenticeship, but based on the last year, the semesters are still the number one product. Um, there's still a lot of people that come in and, and the structured curriculum really applies to them. Apprenticeship is very free form. Um, I'm constantly saying apprenticeship is, w- is what you put into it. Um, because again, the content is very um, based upon what's going on. And it, it is a lot of, I need a lot of input from you. Whereas suppressors show up, watch some stuff. Here's the instructions on how to build it. And it doesn't really require any skin in the game on the, the user's part. Um, at the same time, people love lists. They love to be told what to do, especially when you're new to something. You know, you don't want to go, well, should I be doing this or should I be doing this? Semesters are very much watch this, then build this. Now go watch this, then build this. Um, and, and that structure is, is great. So that is no question. That's what pulls probably 90% of the people in. Um, I do offer discounts on semesters for apprentices and I am getting more people who are looking at it because frankly, the discount is such that you save so much off the semester. If you bought apprenticeship and the semester, you're still actually spending less money. Um, it's only, it's like $5 less, but it's kind of a no brainer, you know, sign up, get a semester and access to this enormous content library and kind of real direct access to me. And yeah, it recurs every single month, but you know what? There's nothing that says you can't cancel it after a month. And maybe you kind of got that initial over the hump kind of consultation, but yeah, I, I, I have a hard time envisioning a time when apprenticeship will outpace the semesters. And if it does, I might need help. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, because as much as we talked about you having a lot of automation in place there, I do know that, you know, you're one of the most hands-on people I know when it comes to actually jumping in and helping your members and 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 things. Um, Eventually, probably what will happen is I'll have graduates um, and, and those graduates can come in and I'll end up bringing them onto my team to help me, I think, in the long oh, run. Oh, I love that idea. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, I've, I've always been a promote within type person. Um, and they understand the philosophy and the environment and, and what, we're, what we're trying to do at the school. So that's something I've been toying with because ultimately, from a fiscal perspective, you know, there is a fixed price point on apprenticeship and it, it's something that, that I really struggled with how to price it because the woodworking world is cheap. I mean, the prices that we charge for our online stuff is a shadow of what you find in like the business sector and the marketing sector, you know, a $500 product, thousand dollar product. Nobody even bats an eyelash $50 a month. No big deal. There is nobody charging $50 a month in the woodworking space for a membership. Um, $30 a month, which is what apprenticeship is, is I think the most expensive uh, option on the market that I know of. Um, A lot of them are $19.99. There's actually very few that are recurring for that matter. Um, There's one that's $10 a month. There's just no way. I I could not do what I do for my apprentices for $10 a month. Um, $30 a month is, is kind of pushing it. 
So what that means is it does limit just how much time I can spend. If I suddenly had 500 apprentices, it would be, it would be difficult um, to maintain the same kind of close knit community. So essentially I think what's going to have to happen is apprenticeship will be segmented um, into levels, apprenticeship, journeyman, master level, you know, to stick with the same nomenclature um, uh, of the apprentice system. And, and that will be like your bronze, silver and gold level of membership, which still means, you know, from my perspective, it still means 500 people. It just yeah. I'm giving more to, you know, 50 of those people, the gold level and, you know, some more down the line. Um, and that's where the graduating an apprentice to journeyman could then maybe mentor apprentices or a team of journeymen could mentor apprentices or something like that. Um, it's a Ponzi scheme, basically. <laughs> no, it's a pyramid scheme. That's what it is. <laughs> Now, I, I love that you've already thought this through, though, of what, what you might do as the site grows and, and you know that that kind of, it's not necessarily going to be sustainable, just you. Right. Um, well, think thinking it through and doing that. it, as you know, are two very <laughs> different things. Yeah. Um, I, you may remember I had a recent epiphany in your own community on uh, Membership uh, Academy, which if you don't know, I'm an Academy member. You should all be Academy members, too. <laughs> Um, Thank you, the $20 in the post. <laughs> hey, no, it was one of those things where I started looking at revenue and, and recognizing that semesters and, and my courses, for lack of a better term, are drawing the lion's share of the revenue. Um, and there is no such thing as passive income, but they're pretty passive income. Semester one was created seven years ago. Um, now, I do think I'm going to have to do some updates just because HD wasn't even a big deal back then. Yeah. <laughs> There's some technical updates that have to happen. But for the most part, um, you know, I'm making money on semester one and I haven't produced a bit of content for that. You know, there's a lot of community stuff going on, but that's all passive. Um, and and that's, that's really nice. And the more semesters that I can create, the more revenue that I'm going to generate. Every time I put out a new semester, I have a huge spike in sales. So it is something that I, I, I can't neglect, um, but there's no question where my heart is. Um, apprenticeship is just, it's the best thing I ever did. Um, as far as my own passion, my own involvement, in, in, in challenge and in, in what I do day in and day out. That's just a lot of fun. I've just discovered I really enjoy teaching is what it comes down to. Yeah, I love that. And is the kind of obviously, and I'm always impressed by the fact that you have a full-time job as well while you're doing all this. Um, so, you know, I, I have no idea how you find the time, to be honest. Um, Me either. <laughs> but is the end game for kind of the, the hand tool school to kind of be your, your main thing that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it probably would have been a while ago. Um, seven years ago when the school started, I was working for a digital marketing company. Um, and it was terrible. <laughs> um, it, it was, it was a great learning experience. Let's put it that way. I learned a lot, but just working day in and day out was just miserable. Wake up with a migraine headache, go to bed with a migraine headache, just not good. And that's what really said, I, I can do something with my following. With the Renaissance Woodworker, the community that I've generated on that website, I can, I can monetize that. So I started that and you know, did, did pretty well, actually, my first year because there was already a community that had been established. And two years after the school started, I actually got laid off from that digital marketing job. Um, last in, first out type thing. It was a small business. We lost one of our biggest clients and like 30% of the company revenue went out the door. And guess who went out the door with it? As I was walking to my car with the iconic cardboard box in hand with <laughs> in the box, I got a phone call from a recruiter for a lumber company who wanted somebody that understood digital marketing and wood. <laughs> And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. You know, in the staffing industry, they call that a purple squirrel or a one-eyed cat. You know, <laughs> he understands wood, woodworking and digital marketing. Yeah, that just doesn't exist. And, you know, this was Thanksgiving. So the holidays were coming. I interviewed the day before Thanksgiving. I was offered the job the Monday after Thanksgiving. And I absolutely jumped all over it. It was an opportunity to run a marketing department, to build a website, um, and, and, and be an army of one marketer. And had it not been for that job, um, 
I probably would have tried to make the Hanschel School full-time at that point. It would have been tough looking back on it and seeing what the revenue was in the first couple of years. Although, you know, if you can dedicate all your time to it, who knows what that revenue could be. Um, because my day job is in the lumber industry, it directly relates to what I do at the Hanschel School. So much so that my boss has actually offered to buy the renaissancewoodworker.com several times. <laughs> um, that's a, as his marketing director, I told him that's a bad idea. <laughs> As much as it might personally benefit me financially, that is a bad idea. Uh, two different market segments, not a good idea. Um, but because there's a lot of parallels, I do have a lot of flexibility to play around in my forum while I'm at my day job, um, to uh, work in other woodworking forums at my day job. I'm constantly swapping code back and forth from the lumber company website to my various websites. Um, I have a lot of the same plugins. They're both WordPress installs across all my stuff. So there's, there's a lot of um, leeway there to kind of play back and forth. If it were a strict separation of day job and, and night job, I don't think I could do it. I don't, I don't think there's a way that I could possibly be able to, to manage it. And because it is relatively parallel um, and because it is a, it is a great job running the marketing department and kind of, no one understands what I do. <laughs> I am far and away the most technical person in the building and I'm really not that technical of a person. So, you know, Hey, what are you doing today? Well, I've got to tweak this JavaScript here. Oh, you lost me. Move on. Go <laughs> ahead. You know? So I have great freedom to, to do what I'm doing that it's a, it's a fantastic job to hang on to. It gives me a little bit of street cred as well. Some of the naysayers and doubters, the Hentel school now look at it and go, well, heck, he works in the lumber industry. He knows wood. He knows his stuff. And I kind of kind of always have known wood. I mean, that that wasn't now I just have kind of an insider's perspective, which adds a little bit of credibility to what I'm doing. In the end, though, something's got to give. Um, we're we're very close to a breaking point now. Um, you know, uh, I have some very specific financial goals that I need the Hanschel School to hit and sustain. Um, before I will turn one off and turn the other one on full time. It's a great situation to be in. Don't get me wrong. Um, if it were a bad job, I would have dropped it long ago. Um, but it's not. And, and, and it still provides challenge and stimulation. And it is nice because in a lot of ways, it can be a test bed because I get to work with um, some more expensive marketing tools that you know a corporation would buy. Um, and I get to see, could this be scaled or is there like um, a non-pro version of, of, of whatever it is? You know, I used Active Campaign at the Lumberyard long before I used it at the Hand Tool School. Uh, I have a slightly um, lesser, I have a pro version at the Lumberyard. I have whatever the non-pro version is at the day job. So there are, there are certain advantages there. Yeah, it sounds pretty much like it's as, as perfect a combination as yeah. you're going to get, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. Anybody who has started their own business or has that entrepreneurial spirit cringes at the thought of going into a company and reporting to other people and dealing with office politics. And that is tough because I, I've seen both sides of that. Um, and I just see how much time is wasted in the typical corporate job. <laughs> that does drive me a little bit nuts, but you know, it's good for me, right? It builds character. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay. So let's change focus a bit now and talk about what you're actually doing on an ongoing basis to grow the hand tool school. So we have touched on this a little bit throughout, but in terms of bringing on new members, what's one thing that's working really well for you? Um, Live. <laughs> Should be no surprise to anyone who, unless you're under a rock, live video, live streaming is, is, is so incredibly effective. Um, the credibility, remember when I talked earlier about the, the flack that I caught early on about who is this jackass? Who does he know? Get me on camera and throw questions at me and you'll, you'll see that I know what I'm talking about. That sounded really arrogant. <laughs> oh, that came off really bad. But no, no. I mean, that, that, forgive me for going marketing speak, the authenticity of live um, really has driven a lot of traffic to the site and a lot of people converting. Um, I, I do a live broadcast 
for the general public every single month. Uh, eventually, I'll probably go to twice a month, probably very soon. Um, cause frankly, it's a lot less work. <laughs> There's no editing on the back end. It's fantastic. Um, I generally will pick a topic and I will dedicate an hour of a live stream to that particular topic. I'll do a demonstration and I'll open up for questions and answer questions. I've been pairing that for all intents and purposes with a content upgrade. Um, I've been repurposing archived content in the hand tool school that has previously never been available. There's my marketing speed. <laughs> It's the Disney vault tactic. It's coming out of the vault. Get Bambi. It'll go away soon in your special plush VHS cassette tape box. Um, I'm pulling content out of the, the archive and repackaging it as a standalone lesson and selling it, you know, for 10 bucks, 15 bucks, kind of tripwire type prices. But it is directly related to that demonstration that I just did. It's kind of, if I were to go for another hour, this is what you would see. And that has generated um, a fair amount of revenue. Um, I think in the total, the total picture, I think it's about 6% of the total school revenue. It's not a huge amount, but in order to buy it, they have to create an account. And when they create an account, they go into the automation web and then they get a series of five emails, each with a video in it that talks about the, the why. Why is the Hanschel School here? Why should you care? Why you should be a member and how you're going to be a better woodworker when you become a member. Um, those emails in video format, um, that makes a huge impact. And I've told time and time again that that sequence really convinced me that this was something I need to try. But I also get time and time again, people going, you know, wow, <laughs> I just watched your live session. You really know your stuff. I'm going to look at the hand tool school now. Um, so yeah, it just, it drives so much traffic that way. So much more than any sales video, any sales email could ever do. Um, and if nothing else, it dumps people into those lead sequences um, because they, they bought that tripwire or um, they just, were intrigued by something I said, visited the Renaissance Woodworker site, which is really my marketing site. The Hintel School has its own marketing as well, but both of them tie into the same lead site, the uh, same list, email list. So somebody may vi visit uh, a live session and get something out of it and go, hey, I want to learn some more from this guy. Let me join his email list. And you know, depending on where they join, there's a different sequence of things <laughs> that, that caters them and nurtures them through the system. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's incredibly effective. <laughs> Awesome. I am a little scared to ever look inside your active campaign account. <laughs> I think it might make my head explode. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Thank goodness they came out with those goals thing because I had yeah. way too many if else things going on. It was when you have to zoom out like six times <laughs> to see the whole automation, that's a cry for help right there. Yeah, I know that feeling. Uh, and so when somebody joins your site, how are you keeping them engaged? I've got a feeling you're going to say through the community here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge aspect. And it's something that in theory, you know, you, we've all been told community, you know, what's, what's the term? Show up for the course, stay for the, Come for the content, stay for the community. Right, yeah. Um, that, we, we all know that to be true, but when it happens, you're like almost shocked by it. Like, holy crap, like people are sticking around because of the conversations going on in the community. Um, I have, again, because my semesters are a structured curriculum, I keep them engaged through the automations that are, that are responding to the videos that they have watched. Um, every video that they watch drops a tag into their profile. Um, if you really want to get technical, it drops a tag into their profile. Um, certain videos are, are different, but it drops a tag into their profile after they've watched a video for a certain amount of time or a certain percentage. So it's not tagging them, you know, they just clicked, you know, and, and went away. Uh, actually it does, but that's a different tag. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done anything with those tags yet, but I have negative tags at the same time saying they didn't watch that video. Um, I'll figure, I'll figure something out what to do with that later. But the sequences that are generated, I have um, automations for every product. So there's a semester one curation sequence that waits for a tag to be applied when they've watched the first video. Um, it sends them an email saying, you know, here's the, in summary, this is what we talked about. Any questions on that? 
with a link to the specific forum thread for that lesson. You know, come over here. There's some other conversations going on about that. And then kind of some pre-work for the applied project. So that's keeping them very engaged because every time they're watching something, they're getting a communication from me, prompting them with, you know, answer this question, answer this question, go and do this, um, or go and download um, the parts list for the project you're about to build. You know, your next step is going to be this project. So go do these things to help you get started on that. And that really, um, the, the metrics on that track very, very well. I mean, the open rates are through the roof on that stuff because it is truly one-to-one communication at that point. And every single bit of content, every video on my site has a button at the bottom. There are no comments on, on the WordPress site itself. Every video has a button at the bottom that says, let's continue this conversation in the community. Actually, it says something different for every page. It's, it's usually related. If they just watched a lesson on chisel techniques, you know, let's talk some more about chisel techniques in the community. Um, so it, it's all very, very related and focused instead of it just being a generic, go to the community button. There's a, there's a call to action, if you will, at the bottom, which drives people from that lesson to a discussion in, in the community. And the rest of it just takes it from there because people are talking up a storm about those chisel techniques and that raises other questions. And yeah, more importantly, it raises questions which I can then turn around and say, you know what, there's a lesson on that if you go over here and click on that, which drives them back into the lesson, which, yeah, it's, it's all a, a wicked... A web is a good term for it now that I think about it. It traps them and sucks them in. <laughs> no, I love that. Um, okay, so going back to the beginning of the hand tool school, mm-hmm. if you could reset and start again, what's the one thing you would do differently? And I know you kind of did reset a year ago, so maybe you've yeah. already done it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I did a year ago. No, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think, hmm. I mean, I, I still very much stand by the curriculum structure of things. And I still very much like that I have both a recurring option and a, a, a transactional option, if you will. Um, because that from a content creation side of things, it's also, it's different for me. It's a different kind of timbre to each thing I create. Um, so that definitely keeps me interested. What I would do besides getting the apprenticeship thing started earlier would be probably to focus a lot more on something that I've been doing lately is tapping into my community in an in real life situation. Um, fostering meetups um, to to build that community first and foremost, but not just, I mean, certainly there, there's nothing wrong with just the, hey, let's get together at a bar and share a drink, but focused meetups. Um, I just recently hosted, for lack of a better term, a, a tour of a, of a local museum, uh, the Winterthur Museum. They've got 115 rooms and over 90,000 pieces of furniture. It's owned by the DuPont family. It's just this Mecca of 18th century furniture up in Delaware. And I called them and I booked a custom furniture makers tour and I got 15 members to show up and it was, it it cost money. You know, they had to, they had to pay admission. Um, It was only $37 for three hours of focused guided tour. But you know, if you did a meetup at a bar, you got to buy your drinks and your appetizers, the same type of thing. So this was, it was, it was phenomenal. Um, it was an opportunity to meet face-to-face 15 people and their spouses in many instances because they, they brought them along because it's a beautiful, beautiful place. We got to talk furniture and woodworking. Uh, we had lunch together. It was just an incredible experience. Um, when I went to Membership Intensive with you and Mike in San Diego, I did a meetup after we adjourned and we went you know, to a local... A sandwich place. And then we went back to a member's shop and we had like an impromptu guild meeting, if you will. And it was just incredible. And the, the relationships that I built from those two meetups have been so strong since then um, and gave me so much insight into what changes I need to make technically content wise to the site. Things that you know, if you're ever in a face-to-face discussion with somebody, they're like, oh, you know, I've been meaning to, to write you about this. I've been meaning to email you about this. And those little things that you forget, but when you're face-to-face with somebody, you get honest 
feedback, very candid feedback. And man, the stuff that I learned from those two meetups, and I've done a third one since then, has just been invaluable. And the whole, what I talked about earlier about um, the apprenticeship journeyman and master's level, I got affirmation on that idea, 100% universal affirmation, that was a good idea. What used to be this kind of thing in my head that maybe it would fly, maybe it wouldn't. Not only did I get affirmation on the idea, but I got some direction on price points as well from the horse's mouth. Um, So whether it's a meetup or a conference or something, the in real life thing, it, it cannot be overstated how effective it can be. You want to talk about live streaming, breeding authenticity? How about live face-to-face? That's even more effective. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the the meetup kind of approach. And I, I love that you've taken it that one step further there. And you've actually, you know, you've taken them to somewhere that's relevant to the membership site and things like that. I, I yeah. really like that you've gone that well, kind of... I mean, hopefully, it, hopefully it won't be awkward, but you never know. Like... If you do a meetup at a bar, it's kind of like, you know, or is anybody going to show up? What are we going to talk about? Plus it's loud, you know, and you end up having a conversation with one person while this other guy's over here, you know, doing it somewhat contextually related. I mean, we've all been taught that in marketing, right? You know, <laughs> Send them something that's, that's relevant. Um, it also just makes it a lot more fun, um, a lot more exchange of ideas. Yeah. I didn't do any of that early on and I attribute, um, Certainly, this is these member meetups or something, but also getting out and and going to conferences, you know, for the general public. Uh, I've attended a couple of woodworking guilds. I've actually been paid to speak at some guilds lately. That's been fantastic. Um, it, I was the typical internet businessman early on, just kind of in my shop and in front of my computer, and you know, banging away on on Twitter and Facebook and and some other apps that no longer exist. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's great. And you can build that community, but it's not really the same. You know, I think the fastest way to get your raving fans is face to face. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to take the online offline in order to kind of superpower things, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so we've touched on this a little bit before, but what's next for you and the hand tool school? What's the future got in store? Hmm. I am um, <laughs> doing George Lucas again. I'm working yeah. on a prequel. Um, <laughs> I, I talked earlier about how I might want to revisit semester one yeah. um, from a technical perspective, but also um, my techniques have changed a little over the last seven years. And I've learned a lot both about teaching, but also about how a beginner to woodworking thinks, how, what they approach, what their questions are. And, you know, anytime you've done something a long time, you tend to forget the real basic stuff, the stuff you just take for granted. And I learned there was a lot of, not a lot, but there are holes in semester one that don't address some of those real fundamentals. So I am in the process of filming a prequel semester 0.5. I hope to release that in August. And I'm really excited about that because it's, it's a, a, a niche of my industry that the total absolute beginner I don't have anything. I don't have a chisel. I've never, I, I know what wood is, but that's about it. Um, and it's exciting. For the longest time, people talked about woodworking is dying. You know, the majority of the, the demographic in woodworking are gray haired men, you know, um, puttering around in their shops. They're all retired. My demographic is squarely in the thirties. Um, these people are young and um, there are more and more young people 20 somethings and teenagers coming into the craft because the internet has opened up this world. And I think going back to that whole DNA comment, the caveman must build stuff. (laughs) I think that has become even more apparent that we need that. And the maker thing, the maker movement has become really, really big. So there's all these people coming into the craft that are so much less informed than my original customer base, my original target audience that you know, came out of the woodworking blogosphere, if you will. Nobody even pays attention to those blogs anymore. They all come from YouTube. And it has democratized getting that information to the point where they have no idea where to begin. So this semester truly starts from nothing. Um, To the point where I went to my in-law's place in Maine to film it, and we'll be going back in August to finish filming it because they have a garage with nothing in it. (laughs) And my, you know... 
one of the problems with my videos is I've got all these tools. I've got this great workbench. I'm sitting at it right now um, surrounding me and people look at it and they get intimidated and go, well, yeah, you know, if I had all those tools, I could build that. Or man, I've got to have all those tools to do that. And then they go on the internet and they find out how expensive tools are and they go, oh, I'll, t- I'll save woodworking for retirement. You know, and that's exactly what we don't want to happen. So it's actually kind of fun because the intro to that semester is filmed here in my shop. And it talks about what I just said. And it poses the question, what would I do if I didn't have any of that? Bam, cut to Maine to an empty garage. <laughs> what if all my tools were gone? It's just this cool little fun film thing. But, and I, I proceed to build several tools that, a, that I think a new woodworker should have using three tools that you picked up at the regular old hardware store, you know, for I think less than $25. And, and they get to see how it's, how it's done in a complete blank space. And I think that that will really, that'll attract a whole new demographic that maybe, I, I doubt that maybe, maybe they have heard of me, maybe they haven't, but they've been thinking, well, that's, I'm not ready for that yet. Yeah. Um, so I, and there's a, when it comes to broadening my niche, my niche within a niche, that's the way to do it. It's to tap into the people who feel like they're not ready yet or don't have the skills to do that yet. Um, so, it's for the Callies that are kind of sat there listening to yeah. this and thinking, oh, that sounds kind of cool, but I don't even know what a chisel is. So <laughs> Exactly. You know, and these are the things that I forget about, you know. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I think that that's going to, to bring a, a lot of new people in. Um, just based on how many current members I have who are excited about it. It's a little, little alarming. It's like, <laughs> you guys know all this stuff already, but I guess it's encouraging. You know, they like me enough to buy stuff even if they don't need it. But um, that, that's, I think, maybe it may be a Star Trek thing where I just created an alternate universe and now we're going forward with, you know, Spock, two Spocks or something like that. Did I just get too nerdy there? I did, didn't I? Yeah, nah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I, semester point five may spawn a, a new line of products that are in that universe, if you will, yeah. um, that go on a different tangent that maybe the current semester one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, don't necessarily address. Um, I don't know. We're going to see where it goes. We're going to see what, uh, what the response is and what those people want to learn next, I think, more than yeah. anything. Interesting times. I look forward to, to seeing where that goes for yeah, you. It's, and it's I feel like we could carry on talking for ages because you've got so much good information, <laughs> but I'll, I'll let you get on with your day, but we'll have to have you back to talk some more because I know that you've got a lot of um, a good stuff there as well. I'd, I'd love to. It'd be fun. Yeah. So, you know, thank you so much for joining me and talking with me. As I said, lots of great stuff there. And, you know, I love hearing about that journey and what you've got planned in the future, especially as well, because I think, you know, it's so easy to kind of not to, to have something good that you've like you've got and that be enough. Whereas you're constantly innovating and making changes, which is one of the, the things I love about watching kind of the progress of the hand tool school. You're you're constantly kind of innovating there. Well, credit where credit's due. That's you guys. That's you. And me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and, you know, here, here's the public service announcement people. So tune out if you want, but <laughs> the hand tool school stagnant was a good word for it. Nah, I mean, that sounds awful. I was creating content. I was putting stuff out, but there wasn't really anything innovative going on. And it wasn't until I stumbled on this podcast called the membership guys. And I thought, who is this weirdo? You know, <laughs> what's up with that accent? Let's check it out further. And then suddenly there was this membership site on membership sites and the, the innovations and the ideas and a lot of the stuff that you guys put forth is what more than anything forced me to start questioning what I was doing. And as much as I'm passionate about woodworking, it reignited passion in problem solving and figuring out how can I innovate? How can I take this to the next level? Because while the hand tool school was very innovative in 2010, it quickly became commonplace. And I think we're back to an innovative stage where the apprenticeship is totally innovative. Nobody's doing it. Um, and and that's, that's what's exciting. So if nothing else, that's the community that you and Mike have fostered that has continued to challenge me and push me forward. So oh, thank, thank you. you. That's, <laughs> that's lovely to hear. Um, okay. So um, I'm blushing now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So before we go, if anybody's listening to this, I'm thinking, I really want to want to learn more about, about Shannon and about the hand tool school. Where can people connect with you? 
Well, certainly HanschelSchool.net is where the, the school happens. Um, RenaissanceWoodworker.com. Again, I still maintain a YouTube channel over there. I put out a video a week over there. Um, I'm not blogging as much as I used to, but there is, um, what year is it now? There's almost 10 years of blog content over there. Um, RenaissanceWW on Twitter. Uh, I've got Facebook pages for the Renaissance Woodworker and a hand tool school. You can find me on Instagram. Actually, I'm on Instagram more than anything now, just because woodworking is so visual. Um, also at Renaissance WW. Cool. I'll make sure to put those links below the video for everybody as well. Um, so that's all awesome. Thank you so much again for your time, Shannon. It's been great having you on the show and I look forward to having you back to talk even more in the future. Uh, it was such a pleasure and welcome to podcasting. I'm excited you have your own show now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure it's a good idea, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> eh, who cares what anybody says, as long as you're having fun, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you. Thanks once again to Shannon Rogers for joining me on today's show. You can see more about Shannon's semesters and apprenticeship program over at handtoolschool.net. You can also find that link and any others mentioned in this episode over at the show notes at themembershipguys.com slash btm8. If you'd like to discuss anything that Shannon mentioned in this episode, then do head on over to our free Facebook group at talkmemberships.com. I'd love to know your thoughts on this episode and your biggest takeaway from Shannon's journey so far. That's it from me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Behind the Membership and I will see you next time. If you've enjoyed today's episode of Behind the Membership, we invite you to check out the MembersiteAcademy.com. The Membersite Academy is the essential resource for anyone at any stage of starting, growing and running a membership website. So whether you're still figuring out what your idea is going to be or whether your website is already up and running and you're just looking for ways to grow it and attract new members, then the Membersite Academy can help you to get to the next level. With our extensive course library, monthly training, exclusive member-only discounts, perks and tools and a supportive, active community to help help you along the way with feedback, encouragement and advice, the Member Site Academy is the perfect place to be for anyone looking to start, manage and grow a successful membership website. So check it out at membersiteacademy.com.